Appreciate you joining with us, our extended family in the Lord, wherever you may be this morning, and we do appreciate you. The Lord bless you, and I trust it will be a blessing to you this morning. My subject today is the children of the desolate. Luke 21, at the 20th verse, if you want to read along. In the ESV, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are inside the city depart. And not let those who are out in the country enter it. Now he didn't just say in Jerusalem. You notice that? He said those in Judea. Judea is a big place. He said get out. Get out. Flee out of here. And don't come back. For these are days of vengeance. To fulfill all that is written. Alas, for women who are pregnant and those who are nursing infants in those days, in other words, woe unto them, alas, the same word, for there will be great distress upon, distress upon the earth and wrath against this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled under the foot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Five verses of scripture, Jesus is talking. He's talking about the events that would shortly take place, starting about the year AD 68, going through AD 70, or Common Era, if, as some it's more properly used today, CE or BCE, before the Common Era. But what is said here is absolutely mind-blowing when you think about it. Jesus is speaking of prophecies that were given in the Old Testament by the prophets that this day would come. And he says, now it's upon you until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And there are 1,800,000 interpretations of that by different scholars and so forth. I, say, I think it's simple. I think it's really simple. <clears throat> Some say the times of the Gentiles was right after it happened. And I mean right after by about 300, 400 A.D. when Constantine made the religion of Christianity the state religion. And Israel wasn't in, problem, in trouble anymore. Well, that's not true because it was still trodden down. So when is the time of the Gentiles fulfilled? I want to read you a prophecy in the book of Isaiah, in the 54th chapter of that book. And I want you to pay close attention to this. Starting at the fourth verse, and reading through the ninth verse. Well, let's start at the first verse, just, just for the sake of reading it. Isaiah says, Sing, O barren one, who did not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud. You who have not been in labor, for the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her who is married, says the Lord. Listen to that. Enlarge the place of your tent and let the curtains of your habitation be stretched out. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For you will spread abroad to the right and to the left and your offspring will possess the nations and will people the desolate cities. Fear not. For you will not be ashamed. Be not confounded. For you will not be disgraced. For you will forget the shame of your youth 
and the reproach of your widowhood, you will remember no more. For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name, and the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. The God of the whole earth he is called. I'm going to read more of this than I originally put down because it, uh, like those first three verses. Anyway. For the Lord has called you like a wife, deserted and grieved in spirit, like a wife of youth when she is cast off, says your God. For a brief moment I deserted you, but with great compassion I will gather you. In overflowing anger for a moment I hid my face from you, but with everlasting love I will have compassion on you, says the Lord your Redeemer. This is like the days of Noah to me, as I swore that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so I have sworn that I will not be angry with you and will not rebuke you. For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. Who's he talking to? For the children of the desolate woman will be more than those of the married wife. So then who is the woman of the desolate children and who is the married wife? To understand that is to understand this prophecy. To know what he's talking about here let you understand this. And know this, Isaiah knew nothing of the time of Christ in that sense of the word. So he's talking about a desolate woman which was Israel and a married wife which was the church as Jesus referred to it as being a bride adorned for her husband. In anger, I deserted you. And I did what I did. But I'm going to put that aside and I will no more rebuke you and I will have compassion on you. Hmm. And more will be the children of the desolate woman than those of the married wife. Verse 8, in the 8th verse here, it says something that is interesting. In overflowing anger, now the King, King James puts that a little different. And other commentators have tried to smooth it out. However, no matter what you do, you can't smooth it out. King James says, In a little wrath, I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. In a little wrath. In overflowing anger. The word there for wrath or anger is interesting. I don't know what this thing is doing, but every time I hit that, something hides my notes. I don't know what it's doing. Anyway. Kesef, Hebrew, is the word used here. According to commentators, some agree, some disagree. (sighs) 
is an outburst of anger. The AHLB gives it as a surge. Benner gives it as a surge. And other commentators have said that the word is or should be shetsef instead of kesef, starting with an SH instead of a K. Both of them are similar in meaning. And I'm not going to go into all the different arguments and so forth because when you read commentators, you have to understand one thing about them. They translate or they commentate biased by what they believe about religion. Regardless of what you may think, they are not just sitting there commentating from a broad spectrum. They're absolutely controlled by what they think about it. For instance... If you go to the word wine, where Jesus made water into wine, they will all say, go read it. They will all say, well, it was the pure juice of the grape. And there's nothing in this scripture that indicates that these people were drunk. They were well drunk, but that just meant they, were, they had drank a lot and they were happy and it was just the fine, you know, the grape juice. And then when Jesus made his wine, it was the pure grape juice and it was not fermented and so forth. I'm trying to explain that away. However, if you go over to where the Bible says, don't be drunk with wine, where Paul is telling a church, don't be drunk with wine, wherein is excess, you'll find the same word. Well, how come you can get drunk on that wine and you can't get drunk on this wine? Same word. And it's from a Hebrew word that means fermented. But we love to try to keep our righteousness in ourself rather than the Lord's righteousness. There's no way they can even imagine that Jesus drank wine. Oh, they'll tell you he drank it, but it was just the pure juice of the grape, not like we have today. Really? Why'd they call him a wine bibber? Said John came neither eating nor drinking. And you said he had a devil. He ate no bread, he drank no wine. You said he had a devil. The Son of Man came both eating and drinking, and you say he's a glutton and a wine bibber. In other words, in our language today, a wino. A drunkard. Why would they say that? You can't get drunk on grape juice. I know I've drank a lot of grape juice in my life, you can't get drunk on it. We love to put things in, our, in the context of what we believe about it instead of letting the Bible say what it says. You all know the story of my story. Years ago, I, I had problems emotionally and thought I was having a nervous breakdown and didn't know what was wrong with me and all that. But finally, the Lord spoke to me one day in prayer and said, read the book. Read the book without prejudice, without pre-taught prejudice. Read it for what it says, and it will bring healing to you. And I started trying to do that without prejudice. I know I've been condemned, and I've been thrown out of a lot of nice places because of what I preach, but that's fine. I don't care. Truth is truth. Now, some take those scriptures as a liberty to go get drunk. Well, no, he said don't be drunk. Don't be a glutton. Didn't say you can't eat. I'm sure glad he didn't say you can't eat. be a lot of dead people following a dead religion because they'd starve themselves to death. He didn't say don't eat. He said don't be gluttonous. Don't be a wine user to the excess. He said let your moderation be known unto all men. We're supposed to be moderate in all parts of our life. Moderate in our temper. 
moderate in our anger, moderate in our dealings with people. We're supposed to be moderate. In other words, not going to one side or the other. As we call this, and I still think it's a good name, balanced life. It's a balance. You don't fall on either side. The scale shouldn't tip. When you get out of balance, you'll get sick. Get too much sugar in your blood and not enough insulin and see what happens. When you get out of balance, there's a lot of things that can happen to you. Most sickness is just an imbalance somewhere in your body. Something's not working right. Lymphoma. Too many bad gene cells. And they begin to take over the rest of it. And when there's too many of them, you die. An imbalance. Terrible imbalance. So, what is he talking about here when he's, when pro, when he's prophesying this about Israel? Go back. To what I just read in Matthew. Or in Luke, rather. Or Matthew. And what's it say down here? In that 24th verse of Luke 21, what's that say? Right on the end of it will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And then he's going to do something again. And he's going to go back to the desolate woman. Scripture speaks of this in several places. So what would be the sign of the end of the Gentiles? dispensation and I'm not a dispensationalist but there's no other way to, to describe that it is a dispensation of the Gentiles because it has a beginning and an end until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled the times of the Jewish economy was fulfilled in 67 AD it was no more and not until 1948 was Israel a nation again. It was trodden underfoot by Gentiles and still would like to be. Did you see in, uh, on the news today, my wife showed me a headline where the Taliban has taken Afghanistan and the president of Afghanistan has fled. We gave it back to the mob, to the haters that hate Israel, that hate all that Israel stands for. All over the Middle East, it's collapsing. And the radicals are taking over. The times of the Gentiles being fulfilled? What was Israel doing before these times were fulfilled for them. What were they doing? Well, first of all, they rejected Jehovah. They rejected the truth. They murdered Jesus, didn't they? They were practicing all kinds of things that were not right for them to do. They compromised. In many, and I know you say, well, the, the Jews hated Rome. They hated the Romans, yeah, but they compromised with them too. Yeah, they did. To try to get along. They, did. Absolutely. they offered sacrifices for Caesar in the temple. Why would you do that? That wasn't allowed. And yet when Paul went into the temple with five men to get their vows released, their Nazarite vow... 
They beat him almost to death saying that he had taken Greeks into the temple. Because a Gentile couldn't go in the temple. That was absolutely wrong. And yet, they sacrificed to Caesar, or for Caesar. Hmm. Who knows what else was going on at the time in the, in the Israeli economy. For centuries, the Lord had been patient. Now, He had dealt with them in anger. He had dealt with them in those things. But he had been very, very patient. And then the straw that broke the camel's back was when they murdered Jesus on that cross that we wear around on our necks and all that mess. And then some people say they have a piece of the cross, the actual cross. Are you kidding me? You, you dumb enough to believe that? Oh, we've got a piece of the actual cross. Yeah, right. We worship things. We worship symbols. We worship relics. Friend of mine, and he's a friend, but I tell him to his face, don't hate him, I don't, I don't dislike him, I disagree with him. He had a picture the other day on Facebook of a Celtic cross that he had put up in their church. And he said, we, we, we had an anointing ceremony, we anointed the cross, we dedicated it the other day. And isn't it beautiful? It's a cross. It's a symbol of death. It was one of the worst ways to to uh, execute someone in the history of mankind because you died very slowly and suffered tremendously. The Romans loved to do it. They did it all the time. They would line the road into Rome with crosses and put and crucify people to show Everyone that came in the city, what happens to their enemies? And they just leave them up there until they rotted. Hmm. And we wear it around our neck. I've often said, if Jesus had have been electrocuted, we'd wear electric chairs around our necks. Had he been killed with a spear, it would have been a spear we're wearing. A bow and arrow, we'd have a little bow and a little arrow and... Where are that? We have symbolized a act of crucifixion into a form of worship. There's one priest, I think he's in Italy. I read this a long time ago. He'll come out every so often with his vial in his hand, a glass vial. And it's just dust. It's just a powder. You'll shake it. And he starts shaking it, and all of a sudden it turns into blood. It turns into liquid. See the miracle? Haven't we done miracles in your name? Didn't say they healed anybody. Haven't we done miracles in your name? In the in days gone past, they had to put armed guards around cemeteries because they were going into the cemeteries, digging up the bones and selling them as artifacts. This is the bones of this prophet. This is the bones of Isaiah. These are the bones of Jesus. These are the bones. And they would sell them. So they had to put guards around the cemeteries. Isn't that amazing? We worship these things. Now, wearing a cross around your neck, is that going to send you to hell? I don't think so. But why do we venerate articles of execution? We're supposed to venerate Jesus, not what killed him. 
Why do you think there was never a, a sculpture or a painting of Jesus? Were there no artists in his day? Well, if you look at Roman ruins, there's all kinds of busts. We know what Julius looked like. We know what Pompey looked like. We know what uh, they all look like because there's busts of them. Go to a museum. But never anything of Jesus. He wouldn't allow it. Do you think, what do you think would happen if somebody today had a bust of Jesus or a painting? They would set that in a place, put 10,000 guards around it, and charge you umpteen thousands of dollars to come and worship before it. And Jesus knew that. So he wouldn't let them. It's not what he looks like. That's not what we're after. It's who he is. It's who he is that we need to understand. So until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. See, we've had the same chance that the Jews had. How long has it been? A couple of thousand years? Since Jesus was crucified? And we haven't got it right yet. In fact, we're waxing worse and worse. Who was it? I can't remember who it was on the news we saw on Newsmax the other, other day that are uh, saying that soft porn is okay for children. What, who was that? Harvard. And then there was, there was another group. This group surprised me. But anyway. It's okay for children. Soft porn, because after all, they're going to do it anyway, so they need to learn how to do it right, so they don't fall into all these other things. Well, that's what we said about sex at one time, wasn't it? I'm being kind of plain today and blunt, but you have to. So, go read the Bible. Read the Old Testament. See if it isn't blunt. Sometimes you have to bleep it. They were blunt. They said what it was. I've seen preachers at different times because of their holiness <laughs> make mistakes and try to get around words. And say, <laughs> It's funny. I can't say that. Like we, we'll never say the word ass. That's what they call the donkey. We say, oh, the donkey. No, the Bible says ass. Which says that's what they are. It was an ass. But we, we, we use that term in a bad way. We've, we've caused it to be used in such a way as we, now in polite society, you can't say it. You can't say it because it means something different. See? We have made it bad. We have made it terrible. Away from its intended use. What are we doing today? They, they said, teenagers are going to have sex anyway. So we need to give them this and this and this so that they don't. And yet abortion rates are so, so much for that. Well, let's just say it this way. Man's going to commit murder anyway. Well, just, you know, let's help him so he kills the right people. Same reasoning. Same logic. There's a, there's a whole series called Dexter. I watched the thing. I thought it was curious. I watched it more because it piqued my curiosity than anything else. But here this, this guy, he was a, an Emmy medical examiner for the police department. And any felon that got away with his crime, he killed. He'd find him and kill him. And he'd take him out and throw him in the ocean. Put a weight on them, tie them up in a canvas bag, throw them in the ocean. And when they finally, some divers went out and they found all these bodies at the bottom of the ocean. He, see, everybody makes a mistake. He should have went out way deeper. But he didn't. You know why? You know what? His dad was a cop. His dad knew he was a sociopath. He knew it. He figured it out. 
So he raised him and taught him to do what he did. So he could kill, satisfy that part of him without getting in deep trouble and not killing innocent people. So he, he just killed guilty folks. They'd get away with murder, they'd get away, and he'd kill them. Same reasoning, isn't it? Let's don't, let's don't deliver him from that. Let's just teach him how to do it in a good way. It's the same reasoning, the same logic. Well, that guy's a thief. Well, let's just teach him how to steal from those that have a lot and can afford to lose it. You can't steal from a poor man. You know, that'd be bad. So go steal from the rich like Robin Hood and give it to the poor. Well, we glorify Robin Hood, don't we? Well, he was a great guy. He stole from the rich and gave it to the poor. <laughs> Do you realize that Jesse James was loved in the area where he lived? Oh, yeah. Nobody even knew what he looked like. Al Capone in his neighborhood in Chicago, the people loved him. Why? Because he, he'd help them. He'd go down to a little lady selling flowers and buy everything she had and give her more money than what she could ever expect for. He helped shop owners. He helped all kinds of folks do stuff like that. They, they looked at him as a philanthropist. But if he said, you're dead, you're dead. That's all it was to it. He'd kill you in a moment. It didn't matter. Cross him and see what happens. So is that okay? Same logic. Same logic. So now we can teach our children soft porn because after all, they need to know, they need to understand. They don't even know what it's about. They shouldn't know what it's about. How depraved are we going to get before the Lord stops this mess? How depraved is mankind going to get? How depraved is the Gentiles going to be? We're the married wife. He went to the Gentile. He sent Paul to the Gentile. And he said, this is my bride. He never spoke of Israel that way. He said, you're my people. My nation. My land. And my chosen people. We were not re they were not referred to as a bride. The bride didn't come in until salvation came through Jesus. Now Jews could be part of the bride, sure. If they converted to the Lord, and they converted to Jesus, and accepted Jesus as Savior, they were part of the bride. Jew or Gentile, it didn't matter. But the Gentile age began then. Jesus said, I'll go to this people. There, I'm, I'm going to in include people that you don't even understand. You, don't, you Peter would not go to a Gentile's house. They were forbidden. You couldn't even go to a Gentile's home. And Peter tells the Lord, I'm not going. God said, yeah, you are. Yeah, you are. I want to bust your hide if you don't. Now, I know that isn't in the book, but it's pretty much what it was. Let that sheet down. And then he tells Peter, he said, don't you ever call what I've cleansed common. Don't you do it. But there'll come a day when the Gentile age is going to cease. Just like the Jewish economy ceased. And the Lord's going to go back again. As Isaiah said, I won't be angry forever. I'm not going to be angry always. And something's going to happen among the Israelis and the Jewish economy. I don't know what it is. I don't know what the Lord's got prepared. But something's going to happen. And he's going to have a remnant of people. He always has had. And he'll have a remnant <clears throat> that love him. John 8, 35 and 36 says, The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free... 
you will be free indeed. All right, let's look at that word free. How are we set free? We're set free mainly from the law of sin and death, but there's other ways we're set free. We're not free to do anything we want to do. Israel found that out. She wasn't free to do anything she wanted to do. She wasn't free to be an idolater. She wasn't free to be a whore. She wasn't free to be a prostitute to the other nations. She wasn't free. I know those. Read the book. That's what the Lord said. You go a whoring after other gods. It's time we just be plain. Say what is what. So that we understand exactly what's going on. The two words used here for free are slightly different. Come from the same word with just a little difference is all. The first one he uses, if the Son sets you free, is to liberate. That is to exempt, deliver, make free. Free from what? The law of sin and death. Liberty from death. Not the liberty, just do anything you want to do. Now, to show you how they corrupt things with their own definitions and so forth, one of the things said about this word is from moral, ceremonial, or mortal liability. Now, who put that definition in there? So, so the Lord made you free from moral responsibility, so you can just go live like a alien and be okay. He sets you free from ceremonial or mortal liability? No. That's in parentheses. <laughs> but the word just means to liberate, set free. The next word free is the same word pronounced a little different. The first one is E-L-U-T-H-E-R-O-O. The next one is E-L-U-T-H-E-R-O-S. A little different. Greek, could, you could change the meaning of a word by one letter in Greek. Okay. It means unrestrained, to go at pleasure. That is, as a citizen, not a slave, whether freeborn or unmanumitted. Man, unmanumitted means to be set free from slavery. Manumitted, free, or generally exempt from obligation or liability. At liberty. So it means to go at pleasure. Well, what, what does that mean? It simply means that I can go in peace and I can rest assured that my Father is with me. He has made me free from fear, made me free from bondage, made me free from the lack of reason in man. <clears throat> so I can be a citizen or a son and not a slave. He made me free to be a son. A son, a daughter, part of the family. He freed me from the laws of sin and death, from the laws of this world, from the laws of mortal man, and brought me into another kingdom whereby I abide by a different set of rules. If you will bow down and worship me, you see all these kingdoms? I'll give them to you. Jesus said, no, nah, I'm not interested in your kingdoms. Wow. wonder what a lot of Christians today would do if they were presented with that. Wow, you know how much good I could do? They'd sit down and try to reason out of it. You know how much good I could do? If I, own, if I had all these kingdoms, I could straighten them up. Really? <laughs> Jesus said, no. I've got, a, I've got a kingdom. And it's not like the kingdoms that men make. It's not like these worldly kingdoms. 
But how, and as I said this the other day, how can you give something you don't own? It? Try to go over and give away your neighbor's car to somebody and see what happens. You can't give something away you don't own. So who owns these kingdoms? Well, can you see? Right now, do you understand what's influencing these people? They're of their father. And it's not Jehovah. And they're acting like it. They're destroying everywhere they can destroy. To kill, to steal, and destroy is why he came. And that's what they're doing. Now they're talking about vaccination cards to travel between states. Can't even cross the state line. What are they going to do? Put up roadblocks? on every highway that crosses into another state? <clears throat> you know how much manpower that'll take? See, you don't hear about the people who are opposed, do you? Jenny was talking to me before service. She's involved in all this mess. And we've got a letter to her bosses and so forth. Two doctors have left practice at the hospital over this, haven't they? They will be. They will be. They will be, yeah. And one of them is a what? He's a pediatric doctor. Pediatric doctor, and the other one? Wow. And won't take the vaccine. They'll quit first. Well, now, wait a minute. They're medical doctors. Don't they understand this vaccine is safe? Willing to quit. Nurses standing up. Just like I said the other day, nurses standing up holding these signs. Oh, we were heroes back during the pandemic before the vaccination. And now we're unemployed. We're fired. The teacher. <clears throat> The CRT stuff in Virginia. She stood up in front of the board and resigned. Right? Yes, she did. I cannot do this. <laughs> Not going to do it. See, there are some people that will that will stand up Amen. regardless of consequences. Jesus stood up regardless. He said, "Go ahead, do what you will." Amen. It can't be that a prophet dies anywhere but Jerusalem, and that's where I'm going. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you that kill the prophets and stone those that are sent to you. And Jerusalem ran with blood so deep it put out fires in the lower parts of the city. Do you realize that? Go read Josephus. It actually put out fires. There was so much blood. Warfare in those days wasn't just a bullet or a bomb. It was all cutting and stabbing. And people bled profusely. Many of them just bled to death. And blood ran so deep it put out fires. Blood for blood. You want to kill the Son of God? Go ahead. But Jesus never backed down. John didn't back down. Looked at that king and said, it's not right for you to have your brother's wife. That, you, know how, you know what that meant? John knew he's... I just gave my life up right here saying that. Ain't right. How many of us would walk up to Mr. Biden and tell him anything? How many Christians would do it? How many preachers would do it? Yeah. They'd pat him on the back and say, oh, we're praying for you. No prophets left in the land. Ain't no prophets. Not that I've seen. Evil men and seducers, the Bible said, will wax worse and worse before it ends. But I, I'm telling you right now, the age of the Gentile period is coming to a close. And after that, the Lord is getting ready to come. The Gentile age is closing. We are getting worse and worse. We are subjecting our children to horrible things. We are teaching stuff that is just absolutely terrible to teach. 
we're telling Jehovah to his face, we don't have to do what you say. Come on. We don't even have to be the gender you say we are. Amen. Come on. We'll be what we want to be. That's what the serpent said to Adam or Eve. You'll be like a God and you can make your own decision between good and evil. Yes, amen. Come on. You can make your, own, make your own decision between what's functional and what's dysfunctional. Yes, amen. You decide. It's your decision. This is what you can have if you just partake of this knowledge. What an apple. The word tree in Genesis, as you know, or you should know, the word used there for tree means counsel in ancient Hebrew. If you listen to the wrong counsel, this is what you give assent with. They're not going to stamp your forehead with three numbers, 666, or in your right hand, 666. It's what you agree with. It's what you assent to. It's what you are willing to put up with to get along and save your life. He that saves his life shall lose it. But he that will lose his life for my sake, the same will find it. Simple. I wonder how many Christians today, so-called Christians, have that kind of courage. I'm not bowing down to you or anyone else. I will not bow my knee. Whether it's a vaccination that you say is forced on me, you have to make you make me take it. If, whether if you don't, if, if I don't, I can't buy or sell or travel or go anywhere. Fine then you know what? The Lord will feed me. Amen. He'll set me a table in the wilderness, David said. The Lord is my shepherd, I will not want. He makes me lie down in, by, in green pastures and he leads me beside the still waters. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Because he is my shepherd. And I won't want any good thing. Elijah's sitting out in the cave. (laughs) Don't have nothing. Don't have anything. All of a sudden, a messenger says, Elijah, get up and eat. What? Oh, I've prepared some food for you over here. And you'll go in the strength of this meat for 40 days. That's going to be pretty good vitamins in that. I don't know what it was, but it was good food. Hagar is found in the desert by a messenger from the Lord with her child. She's dying. She doesn't have any food, no water. She's in the desert. And the Lord had mercy and sent an angel and said, Here, have a drink. Here's some water. Here's some food. I haven't haven't forsaken you. When she was put out. Now are there those that have given their lives for the, for the sake of, of Christ? Yes. Absolutely. Doesn't mean the Lord's always going to deliver us. But even if he don't, we will not bow down to you. Know this, King. Our blood will be on your hands. And God doesn't take that lightly. The blood of your brother Abel cries unto me from the ground. What'd you do? What'd you do, Cain? What'd you do? Vengeance is mine. What Isaiah say? I'll forget the day of my vengeance. Well, he took vengeance. And he took vengeance many times. And he took it in 70 AD. He took it really good there. Destroyed completely the Jewish economy. Scattered them throughout the world. Said, I'll scatter you among all nations. And it happened, didn't it? But he said, there's going to come a time when the age of the Gentiles is going to be fulfilled. And then I'm going to go back to the desolate woman. And more will be her children than those of the married wife. I don't know how that's all going to take place. I don't know. I just understand what it says. I understand what it says. I know 
And I've had this happen to me when I was young. Been a long time ago. <clears throat> Yesterday at my house, I, I took an old washing machine out of, out of my house and I put a new one in by myself. And then I went out and worked in the yard, done a bunch of stuff. And when I sat down last night, I couldn't hardly get back up. <laughs> this morning I'm having a tough time. <laughs> I'm glad I can still do it, but I'm paying more for it today than I used to. That's the thing. <clears throat> Comes harder. But you got to do things. So why, are you going to sit around and not do anything? So a little pain comes. So you have to suffer a few things. Okay, but I'm still going to do it. Still going to do it. It don't matter. I'm not going to go sit down and act like a vegetable. Not going to do that. What are we going to do when we're faced with these things? Brian said it many times. The young girl, I think it was in Denver in the school, a guy pointed a gun at her and said, do you believe in God? And she said, yes, and he shot her. Young, 15, 16, 17 year old girl shot her. She said, yes, I do. I believe in God. Didn't, didn't back down. Didn't try to get out of it. Didn't try to save her life. She said, yes. When I was young, as I started to say, I thought about those things. I thought, well, the Lord's coming, but you know, I've got children, I've got a wife and kids, and I want to see them grow up, and I'd like to see them with their own families and grandchildren and stuff, and if Jesus comes now, that's all going to go away. And That would come to my mind at times. And now it does to yours. Well, I, you know, I've got college, I've got a job, I've got this, I've got that, I want to do this in my life, and I want to, I understand that. I understand. But see, ultimately, even if you have all that, it gets over with. Someday it ends. And your job, your children, your wife, your husband, all the places you've been will be not even a memory because you won't be able to remember Solomon said, there's no remembrance in the grave. Ain't no remembrance there. You're just there. He despaired of it all. <laughs> he did. I don't care what you say. Solomon just despaired. What's it matter? I work all this stuff. I get all this stuff. I've got all this wealth. And when I die, it's going to go to somebody that's going to waste it. That's what he said. I know he said it in more proper English than that. The way it's written. Yeah, but he said, that's what's going to happen. I'll leave this to somebody that will waste it. So he says, what, what's, all the, what's all a man's labor for? He said, it's better just to sit under your own vine and drink your own wine <laughs> and just watch the world go by. <laughs> now, I'm not saying don't have a life. I'm not saying don't do any. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying... If we don't want the Lord to come back, then we're fooling ourselves. I want to see him come. I want to see him come. I want him to come back. You know why? Because I know I've got another life better than this one. In another kingdom better than this one. And I will be there a citizen and not a slave. See, right now they're trying to make us all slaves. Whether you believe that or not, they're trying to make you a slave. We will make you do this. Well, that's a slave. <clears throat> that's not a free person. That's not somebody with liberty. That's not somebody with rights. They're taking your rights away from you. Or they're trying. But I'm going to a city Amen. where the roses never fade. Here they bloom but for a season. And soon their beauty is decayed. But I'm going to a city 
where the roses never fade. I remember Brother Allen singing that song. He sang it all the time. Loved ones gone to be with Jesus in their robes of white arrayed. Now waiting for my coming where the roses never fade. There's an old song that I think Don Williams did, if I'm not mistaken. He kind of talked it. And I can't remember just but a few words of it. I think about it sometimes, though. It says, if you go first and I remain to walk this road alone, walk slowly down that golden path, for soon I'll follow you. See, we're all going to follow. Nobody's escaped out of it yet but three people. Methuselah, not Methuselah, but Enoch, Elijah, and Jesus, and maybe Moses. Yeah, Moses, maybe. See, uh, we don't know. So, so why not prepare for another city? I saw a city coming down from God out of heaven, and sat upon that new earth, and. The kingdom of God was with men. Men, not angels, not spirits, not ghosts. Men. Why do you say men? Adam was a man who was eternal until he lost it. Labor not for rewards in this world, but labor for that that doesn't perish. Lay up your treasure where it doesn't perish. Where thieves can't break through and steal and moth and rust doesn't corrupt. Yes, amen. 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 The age of the Gentiles is being fulfilled. And God is getting ready to do something really different. And when the age is done, when the Jewish economy ended, it ended with a bang. How's the Gentile age going to end? with the coming of the Lord. That when that is seen, many, many, many will turn to the truth and still be saved. It doesn't say you can't be saved after Jesus comes back. There's going to be a lot of people. When they know all these people have disappeared and gone out of here, Gonna shake them up some. Where do you people go? Where are they? And Jesus is going to become real to a lot of people. And they're going to bow their knee and cry, Father. I don't know. I mean, that's my opinion. You, you have your own. I'm not saying it's hard, and fast, you know, chiseled in rock. I'm just saying that's my opinion. But something's going to happen when this age ends. It'll end with a bang, just like the Jewish economy ended with a bang. Amen? All right. That's what I wanted to say today. Said it. I'm glad I said it. Don't take anything back. Amen. Praise the Lord. Anything? Question I think many people think about. I have, so I think about it pretty regular kind of deep. So I would imagine it comes to other people's minds, but it's been over 2,000 years since Jesus, right? And we think, how long is this going to take? Well, and I didn't think of this part of it until you said something just now. But it was 120 years from the time Noah started building the ark to the because it was the time span right. that it took for Noah to build this thing and right. to get in it so that the Lord could do. Yeah. And I I've, I've thought this part of it for a while. I really have. Um, this earth is corrupted. It's gone. It's gone. And it says it's going to burn with a fervent heat and all that. I do believe that there is a place where Jesus, when he went, I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, 
you also will be. And I believe there's a new earth, a new heaven, a new earth being taken care of and done. When that's prepared, when that's done, when that's ready to bring those that are there. And, I, and that's why I think Jesus said, I don't know the day nor the hour. Only the Father in heaven knows that. Because he's it's being done right now. And, and I know that sounds crazy. And everybody goes, that's not spiritual enough. And it seems pretty real. Yeah. Right? There's 225 billion known galaxies in the universe. Uh, so there's got to be another <clears throat> place somewhere that he can do this in. I'm just saying. Seems practical. Seems logical. Because we always sit around and go, how is Jehovah putting up with this? I'm going to give you a space of time. The time that's going to take me to put together another place. Because we always think, you know, because creation, our creation narrative says he did it in six 24-hour days. So why can't he just do that? No. That's not the way I want it. I don't believe that. And I think that's a very, yeah. I think that's a very, uh, apropos thought process and it also gave man it gives us plenty of time you you, you can't say well we didn't know <laughs> yeah it takes longer to build a planet and everything that, and, and all that needs than it does to build a ark <laughs> right <laughs> I don't think Noah could have built a planet <laughs> and that's a, I, that's just again something that I've Man was made for the earth, mm -hmm. and the earth made for man. Oh, yeah. It is self-sustaining. Right. It takes care of itself. It provides for us everything we need. And yet we, we look at it like, just, you know, we don't even, it's a spaceship. Greatest spaceship ever built. Better than the USS Enterprise, and all of them. Better than the Cleons could make, or any of them. This is a spaceship. You realize I've been around the sun 79 times in my life. 79 times I've been around the sun. It takes a year to circle the sun, doesn't it? I've been around it 79 times. That's pretty good. I mean, I've traveled some. So have y'all. Yeah. However old you are, that's how many times you've been around the earth. Yeah. Or sun, rather. So, you know, and we have oxygen. And, and we, 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 this is done, too, without being encased in anything. We're not inside nothing. We're just here. How does the atmosphere stay on the earth? Well, it's gravity. What's gravity? They don't know. They have no idea what gravity is. <clears throat> it is not magnetism. You're not held here because there's a big magnet in the center of the earth and holds you down unless you got some metal in you. It's not magnetism. What's gravity? They, they have wondered for years what gravity is. They don't know. It just holds us here. And the earth spins to make the days and so forth. You go to the other planets, weights are different, everything's different because gravity's different. Depends on the size of the planet and so forth. I mean, you, when you think about the earth, friend, and it just happened. Pop, there it was, boom, the earth. Are you kidding me? If I wasn't a believer in Jehovah, I wouldn't believe that. I've said it for years. If I didn't believe in Jesus, I still wouldn't believe in evolution. I couldn't. You're going to have to tell me something better than that because, friend, it don't float. It just don't float. <laughs> Dear Lord. Anything else? Yes. But there's still that inner peace 
amen, that somehow maintains if you can just stay that stay grounded. And so in that, it's I, I try to you know like I want my you know all my family, my friends. Did I tell them enough? Did I are they are they going to be saved? And so every opportunity that I get, I try to see and seize it. I fall short many times, but um, I picked up an extra ship, you know, so I'm trying to just in case. Um, I am very excited to see what he's going to do, but at the same time, um, he put me uh, in the path or presence of this man who tried to commit suicide. Now, this man, just to paint a picture, he kind of looked like Adam Sandler in the cartoon Hotel Transylvania, and he sounded like him too. So that was really neat. But I prayed, the, I'm like, there's a reason I'm here with this man. And I prayed, I'm like, God, I don't know what to say. Can you just say it for me? And then many times, uh, when I find myself in that situation, and I'll say that little prayer, and sometimes I'll think that I sound stupid with what I say and doesn't make any sense, and then they look like, oh, that was the greatest thing I've ever heard of. I'm like, oh, thank you, God. That, that wasn't me. So I'm just sitting there talking to this fella, and he describes the gruesome way that he tried to do it to himself, almost like I'm telling you my secret recipe for chocolate chip cookies. Just very calm and plain, and we got to talking, and he knew the Bible very well. Um, he ended up having a very small son, which kind of all of that took place because of custody kind of things. But in talking about the Bible, we talked about how um, Enoch and Elisha and you know, Jesus, they were just taken. And he said, in Moses. And I'm like, yes, in Moses. Like, he knew. Wow. And we had this great conversation. And, you know, he's like, oh, I think a lot of people that came to be uh, the person, that, that the role that I was filling at that moment, just kind of shunned them. Like, you're a weirdo. You tried to and I mean, everybody that's hurting, like it's the hurting people that, that need it, not the, the religious people. And so a lot of um, times, I think just with my stance, if people ask me, and you know, are you vaccinated? Like, it'd be better if they didn't know, because it'd be easier for me, but I feel like I shouldn't lie. And so I tell them, and I think just amen, because of the character I've showed so far, just being helpful, being nice, being kind, then it's, it's, it goes good for me, and I'm excited to see what he's going to do. And I was fortunate enough that God put uh, in my path some other people that were scared. They didn't want to do it. They didn't know what to do. And somehow, like, he just put them in the right path. You know, when we were able to talk, I was able to share information of a larger group that has resources for them. And it's just, like, the world's getting crazy. <laughs> and, um, everybody. Everybody. Play, I'm excited to see what he's going to do. Everybody has thoughts like that. But here's the thing. Everybody's given a chance. Ain't nobody on the face of the earth had not been given a chance. So it's what you do with it. I know I've thought about the same thing, you know. Well, I've got loved ones that aren't believers. I've got this, I've got that. Well, they're going to die someday anyway. So what are they going to do if they die? And they die that way. They die in a believer. There's nothing I can do about that. I can't help that. <clears throat> but everybody's been given a chance. Now, I'm not going to go into this very much, but it's something I believe. The Bible says that Jehovah is just. He is a just God. He is just down to the nth degree. There is no injustice in him. Okay? The Bible does speak of people who never heard, never heard the gospel. If you've never heard, and I've, I've been asked this question many times, well, what about if somebody's never heard about Jesus? God will deal with them according to his own justice. If they never heard the name, never heard, had the opportunity, I don't know how the Lord's going to deal with that. It's none of my business. But he's just. So, if the Bible speaks of, of this, it says, if you don't know better, he that knows to do good and doeth it not to him is sin. But if you don't know, if you don't know, and I can't recall the scripture exactly, but it, it, it deals with that very thing. So, in areas of the world, for instance, where people have grown up completely ignorant, know nothing of the Lord, if they've never heard, 
Then are they guilty? I don't know. But the Lord, I know this. He's just. So I don't worry about it. He's just. He'll deal with that. I can't deal with it. Not up to me to deal with it. And I can't sit around and worry about it. But he's just. So I know the justice of God will prevail. It will prevail. Now, <laughs> people say, well, that, you know, that's just the, the church's fault because we haven't taken the gospel to them. Well, friend, there's still Indian tribes in South America. We don't even know where they're at. Let alone get to them. Now, some have been reached. But many of them, we don't even know where they're at. So, still to this day. So, so if you've never heard, I'll find that. Maybe I'll find it, what I'm talking about, and I'll share it with you next time. But, but uh, Scripture deals with that. It deals with it. Yeah. Anything else? I can't even think of the... It's there in my mind. I, I can't quite get it. I'll, I'll have to find it. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to find it. Anything else? All right. Lord bless you. Thank you for watching today on Food for Life TV. We do appreciate it. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you in all your ways. Acknowledge Him and He will bless your life and cause you to walk before Him in blessing. Amen. The willing and the obedient, according to Isaiah 129, will, or 119 rather, will eat the good of the land. If you be willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. So be willing, be obedient before the Lord, and God's blessing, His hand will rest upon you and your life. Be blessed. Go in peace with the Lord. Amen. Until next time, we see you again. Remember, give love and give life and give Jesus. Amen. I had a good thing going. I was going in.